special Nina. Oh my gosh, sorry. I it, I don't know if your sound is. I, I I'm hearing some sound issues, but hi everybody, welcome to night school. I think uh, did did you change your uh headphone connection or something or? Um. Everyone, the waiting room on for us. issues um did did your uh yeah you're, you're sounding a little robotic christina um okay do you want me to do the set back on okay i at this point i am not hearing you at all <laughs> um which is yeah a question mark but hi everybody welcome to night school um my name is aria sorry for the little technical difficulties here i'm just gonna go ahead and intro us cue us up and uh we are night school we're a program of the cal academy of sciences in san francisco and we're kind of a spin-off of nightlife which is a weekly in-person program for uh adults that mixes science culture and art every thursday night uh and we here at night school are the online version and tonight is an extra special night, as you may have picked up from my hat. Um, it is our albino or our alligator with albinism's twenty uh, seventh hatch day. His name is Claude, and he's been with us at the academy since two thousand eight. Uh, but he was born in nineteen ninety five in Louisiana and raised in Florida before he joined us as a teenager. So we decided to ask three guests who specialize in studying swamp critters of all kinds to join us tonight for a full-on swamp party. And first up, uh, we have Arik Hartman, who is a PhD student at the University of Florida. Um, and he's gonna introduce us to the, in his words, uh, weird, wacky, and underappreciated reptiles and amphibians of the swamp, as well as share some of his work in the wetlands. And next up, we'll have Samantha Bach, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Georgia, talking all things alligator babies, um, including sharing some great photos of alligator nests, as well as research into how a rapidly changing climate. There's Christina. Hi. How's it sound now? Much better. Hey, sorry, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I was just I was just introducing Samantha, but um, yeah. yeah uh, Samantha's gonna share some great photos uh, and also about how climate change might impact the future of American alligators. And closing us out tonight is Dr. Solomon David, who's a professor at Nichols University. And he's also, for any Pokemon fans out there, kind of like a real life Pokemon gym leader, except with like gar types. And gars are basically a type of fish that belong to a very, very ancient lineage of fishes. And they are very impressively adapted, spectacularly lengthy, and all around fascinating, as are the rest of the critters that we'll be talking about tonight. But first, <laughs> we put together a special quad birthday video. Did you already talk about our hats? Uh, okay. Very briefly. <laughs> so these are Claude, cool Claude visors. You can find the pattern on the Academy website. Um, but our guests are also wearing special party hats. So we're going to bring them on. Um, Solomon and Samantha. She doesn't have a hat, but she does have a cool alligator behind her. And Arik. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Hatch Day, Claude. Um, so yeah, we're all here celebrating with our hats. And um, yeah, let's let's get the let's get the video playing.
<laughs> that's it. That's our birthday video. Um, <laughs> hope you really professional. <laughs> Very professional. It was totally made by um, a machine on an iPhone. Um, anyway, sorry, this has been a little bit um, hectic because not only is it a really big day for the Academy, my sound was an issue, but we're gonna we're gonna keep going. Um, as always, tonight's program is very live. We're gonna do a Q and A with each guest after their presentation. So please drop your um, questions for our guests in the chat and uh, we'll get to as many as we can after they present. Um, so first up, we have Ara Cartman. <laughs> All right, I think we're good. Uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, I'm R. Cartman. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Florida, and for my entire professional career as a wildlife biologist, I have worked in and around, or lived in and around, different wetlands, mostly swamps in the southeastern United States. I'm from Louisiana, and I work now in Florida. So, what a big jump! But I kind of want to start my talk by dispelling some of the uh, thoughts or uh, misconceptions we might have about swamps and the creatures that, that live in there. And this is a pretty good prime example of a swamp. This is a bald cypress swamp in Big Cypress National Preserve in South Florida, where I worked for a number of years. And if any of you have really good eyes, you might have noticed there's actually an alligator looking at you in this photo. There's actually several of them in this, in this picture. Uh, but it kind of illustrates what we think about swamps, right? There's this element of danger and spookiness. Um, but I think they're phenomenal. I hope I can convince you why. But I want to start with some terms, like what's a swamp? Uh, what are these other words, right? Bog and marsh. You know, you might be familiar that these are types of wetlands, but how do we distinguish them from one another? And they're largely determined by the characteristics of the water and their vegetation types. And swamps, a really fast uh, and dirty way to, to delineate a swamp, right, is that they're tree dominated wetlands. And oftentimes they're riparian, meaning they follow a river or a river basin. And this includes our uh, quintessential like Louisiana Bayou swamps um, like that are dominated by bald cypress trees or um, and swamp uh, Tupelo. But this also includes uh, coastal swamps like mangrove swamps. This is a red mangrove swamp in the Everglades where I've also worked. And this is, you know, a saltwater swamp. So just think of swamps and trees in water and you should be good most of the time. But these other wetlands um, like marshes, uh, are usually dominated by grasses, reeds, or herbaceous vegetation. They can be coastal, they can be riparian, they can also be seasonal. This is a sawgrass marsh in the Everglades that fills up with water in the summer and is dry for uh, other parts of the year. And then this third type of wetland uh, is a bog. And these are dominated by mosses, usually sphagnum mosses, and they accumulate all of this organic matter in the form of peat. And oftentimes they're stagnant, they kind of smell a little rank, uh, but we tend to kind of bleed a lot of these, uh, these different wetlands together and they're, they're kind of distinct. But when we think about a swamp, if you close your eyes and you think about a swamp, you're probably thinking maybe about a fictional swamp uh, and you're probably not having the best thoughts. So if we look at some of these popular swamps or marshes in, in, in popular media, right? They're not the best. So the swamp of eternal sadness and the never ending story probably traumatized like thousands of kids in the eighties when the horse dies, right? Um, the dead marshes in Lord of the Rings where Frodo and Sam have to take the ring to Mordor and they have to go through this horrible marsh. Uh, the Bog of Eternal Stench and Labyrinth, right? So just even these names, Dead Marshes, Eternal Stench, Swamp of Sadness, they just illustrate a point that a swamp, a marsh, it's not a place you want to be. And you only kind of go there out of desperation. And the swamp planet of Dagobah in Star Wars, where Luke goes looking for Yoda, right? Just kind of hits that home, right? You go to swamps if you want to see wet little green things. And he was looking for Yoda, and I'm looking mostly for... Uh, frogs, right, for, for alligators, for, for those things that most people don't want to see. So when we think of swamps, you know, we do think of frogs a lot of times. We think of them calling, 
Um, but that's not the element of danger that we think of with a swamp, right? We think of things like alligators, these large prehistoric reptiles kind of slurping around. We think of venomous snakes like cotton mouths, right? That could potentially bite us. Uh, we think of these massive dinosaur-like turtles just lurking in the water. And we might even think of just all the mosquitoes that are there. And this is enough to keep people away from swamps. But these are the things that keep me in swamps and some of my favorite things about swamps, even mosquitoes. So swamps just harbor this diversity of life, particularly with amphibians and reptiles. And I kind of want to uh, go in by... Um, sharing some of my favorite weird animals within these swamps and maybe some facts about animals that you're familiar with like the alligator but if we look at swamps and how they're distributed in north america they're pretty much all of our true swamps are situated in the southeast united states in these bottomland hardwood swamps which are these cypress tupelo swamps but here in florida we have a really big diversity of wetlands. We have these mangrove swamps. We have the Everglades, uh, the Greater Everglades ecosystem, which includes these miles and miles of uh, grasslands. And I've had the privilege to work in the Atchafalaya Basin in Louisiana with these really cool, again, quintessential bayou swamps, uh, these beautiful cypress domes in uh, Everglades National Park. Uh, also these beautiful mangrove swamps on the coast of Florida, and then these sphagnum bogs where a lot of these cool salamanders live in Northern Florida. And there's all these different species of, of herbs that are associated with these different wetland types. But first I wanna probably talk about something you're all familiar with, which is the American alligator. So this is the Everglades in the background. This is the river of grass, and this is a view of it from a helicopter when we'd be doing um, surveys for nesting alligators. And American alligators have this huge range throughout the Southeastern United States, but in the Everglades, they do something a little bit different than they do in other places. But before I get into that, I wanna talk about the second crocodilian that we have in Florida, and that's the American crocodile. And a lot of people don't realize that we have a native crocodile species in the United States. And the northernmost uh, distribution of it is in Southern Florida, it barely gets into the Everglades and into parts of the Keys and then Big Cypress. And you can go into Everglades National Park where this picture was taken and just see these crocodiles on the docks. And it's, it's just phenomenal, these are, more associated with these mangrove swamps. They're a saltwater species and they have these cool glands on the underside of their tongues for expelling salt water, um, salt from salt water that alligators do not have. But you can see these species side by side. So um, I hope you didn't know that, that we have crocodiles and you can go tell all your friends. But in the Everglades, uh, alligators are particularly special because they're excavators. In the Everglades, you don't have um, a real winter, you have a wet and you have a dry season. So in the dry season, uh, alligators hunker down in these holes that they make. They dig these massive pools uh, in the limestone there. So here's an aerial view of us on a helicopter and we're looking around for an alligator hole in that marsh and you can see it right there, that big hole. So alligators will construct these over years and years to wait out um, the dry season. And so this is really important, not only for alligators, but for all of the species that use um, that pool whenever it's dry. Um, so they're ecosystem engineers, just like beavers are. They augment the habitat and so many other species rely on them. Uh, but they also use these, um, these areas to build nests. So female alligators will build and construct nests. And we'd go in, land the helicopter, and you know, do some nestling surveys and assess the health of these little baby alligators. So even if you knew alligators were a thing, you might not know how different they are ecologically in different parts of their range. So alligators in the Everglades do things that alligators in other parts of the range don't do, which I think is, is pretty awesome. And so I wanna talk now about some of the weirdos. My favorite animals in the whole world are salamanders. So I'm gonna go a little hard on these. Um, some of my favorite salamanders are these weirdos. These are sirens. They're in the family Serenidae. They uh, include just two genera, siren and pseudobranchus, and they are endemic to the southeastern United States in these swamps. Uh, they're elongate. They kind of look like eels, but they have these beautiful branchiated gills like an axolotl. And the funnest thing is they don't have hind limbs. They only have these arms and they use them to crawl around. And they're so common, they're so abundant uh, in these different swamps and so many people don't know they exist. 
um, they can be really large. The greater siren can be a hundred centimeters, so a meter in length, that's a three foot long salamander. Uh, and the smallest siren is still being described by scientists at the Florida Museum. And it's found in the Western Panhandle of Florida and it's less than like 10 centimeters, I think in length. And it's probably gonna be called siren minima. Uh, and these are a phenomenal uh, group that again, you can only find within these swamps and it makes them really special. There's also the Pseudobranchus genus, which is these beautiful striped uh, dwarf species of salamanders that I get at a lot of my sites. And they're absolutely one of my favorite things to see. And pulling up a siren in a net is, is a, always a real struggle. You have to kind of wrangle them. So here's one in, in one of my nets and you can see it pulling itself with those little front arms. It really doesn't need back legs. It just kind of moves and swoops around. Um, but these are, fantastic animals. And I'm going to talk a little bit about another group of salamanders, which kind of looks similar. And this is the Amphiuma and the family Amphiumidae. They're, again, an elongate, weird, grayish uh, group of salamanders. And there's only three species. And we tell them apart by counting their toes on their little matchstick arms. I don't know if you can see the limbs, but they have these severely reduced limbs uh, with either one, two, or three toes on them. And these are the longest salamanders in North America. Amphiuma means can get 115 centimeters in length. That's longer than a hellbender. It might not be as heavy, but it's much longer than an adult hellbender. And so many people, again, don't know that these animals exist. And they're only found within the southeastern coastal plain in these swamp lands as well. And people in Louisiana, they call them conger eels. Uh, they, pe many people think they're eels if they do see them when they wash up during a rain, but they're actually salamanders. Uh, they have these little rudimentary eyes where they can't really see uh, too well. Um, this guy, if you don't believe me that they actually have digits on those little limbs, this is a three-toed amphiuma, and you could count the one, two, three toes that they have. And so every year uh, I go help the wildlife techniques class capture some of these amphiumas uh, at the University of Florida and students get their first encounter with these humongous salamanders. They get to touch them, hold them, look at their little useless feet. I'm gonna play that again because I think it's super adorable. And these are really abundant. Um, they're kind of secretive, but they exist in really, really high numbers. Uh, they have these really cool, scary recurved teeth, but they don't bite very often. And even students, right, who study wildlife, who take these classes, they don't know that these things exist in their backyard. So there's a real need to kind of educate more people about these weird lurking creatures. And I try to do that every time. I'm such a, a proselytizer for amphiumas, I feel like. Um, and just to contextualize like what I actually do, because I'm just talking about my favorite things, I'm a disease ecologist and I work with amphibians and reptiles and their diseases. And I primarily work with the amphibian chytrid fungus BD, which has caused declines and extinctions of amphibians worldwide, and then ronavirus, which is this really broad host group of viruses that can infect amphibians, reptiles, and fish. And both of these pathogens are associated with um, amphibian declines around the world, and they overlap significantly in their geographic and host range but we still don't know how these pathogens interact. So I study these pathogens in these diverse communities of amphibians to try and understand how they might be working together to drive certain species to extinction. And just gonna present a little bit about my work and I won't go too detailed into it, but what I look at is I try to assess patterns of infection within these diverse communities. And what we're finding is that, of course, these species show different infection patterns, but the pathogens themselves can interact with one another in a host, and that influences the progression of disease, what hosts get infected, which ones don't, uh, and how co-infections might uh, expedite disease or protect from uh, disease in some cases. We're also able to identify species that might be likely to vector pathogens to more sensitive species. Oftentimes these are really common species that are reservoirs like this little cricket frog here. And the whole like brunt of my work uh, hinges on conservation. And we're finding that rare species in the Southeast, they're declining. Um, this plot here is just showing the difference of newt detections of this rare species, the striped newt, 20 years apart, and I'm catching far fewer newts than my colleague Steve Johnson did in the late 90s. Uh, and it's largely due to the introduction of these new pathogens into these systems. And these pathogens can come in and they can restructure the amphibian community, where once you might have a really diverse community with a bunch of different species or families, uh, 
if you remove some of those rare species, you end up homogenizing the pool. So we're losing that diversity. So even if the habitat remains intact, uh, you can still lose biodiversity when you have these diseases. And that's kind of the crux of my work. So what I want to kind of just impart with you all is don't drain the swamp. I really hate that term. I wish they would just, I don't know, get rid of terrible politicians. I don't know, make it more catchy than that. But I hope I've convinced you that swamps and wetlands are awesome and they're beautiful. And if you don't believe me, you need to go check out some of the springs in northern Florida. They're absolutely gorgeous. Um, and they support this high diversity of amphibians and reptiles that you can't find anywhere else, such as alligator snapping turtles. Uh, and amphibians and reptiles are already declining globally. Uh, and fear mongering really doesn't help, uh, doesn't help when we also demonize their habitat, uh, aside from demonizing the animals. Uh, and we can support our conservation of, of all these creatures in really diverse ways. It's protection of habitats, it's uh, decontamination, it's legislation. So I hope I've inspired you to maybe get out and approach those swamps if you're in an area that has swamps, but do it kind of safely and reliably. Um, and with that, I'd like to just say thanks to my lab and, of course, my, my friends Javi and Alberto for taking phenomenal photos and everybody at the Florida Museum and the different departments here at UF who helped me do my work. Uh, and I hope I have time for any questions. You sure do. Um, I do. <laughs> thank you so much, Shark. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I never thought about how the phrase drain the swamp might affect people who you know love the swamp and care about it so thanks for yeah um well first question so you um are you from you said from the swamps from swamp territory so what's your what's the wildest experience you've ever had when you were out in the field in a swamp or not doing field work just personally <sighs> Oh my gosh. I mean, I feel like I'm personally and in the field, it's kind of like uh, the same. I think the wildest um, time I've been in the field was we were doing a crocodile hatchling survey. Um, I was helping some friends with the Croc Docs, which are a group out of um, uh, UF uh, has like this sort of like outpost in South Florida. And it's a group that works with crocodilians. And we were doing hatchling surveys uh, in the summer when these big storms roll in and we were just a little too late with our timing trying to get out of there. So we spent all night, you know, in a bug suit on a little boat with hundreds of crocodiles, like babies in a boat with us, measuring clipping scales and then a thunderstorm is rolling in and we need to get in our little boat and head out and our light isn't working on our boat and mm -hmm. <laughs> so the waves are getting bad it's starting to storm there's lightning striking and i have to guide the boat by holding a big like uh light like a torch on my shoulder at the head of the huh. boat like a, a prow or something and we're just going up and down i was like i'm gonna die in this bay <laughs> not even from the crocodiles not from anything not a shark i'm gonna just die from a thunderstorm which is probably the biggest threat in the field in Florida. <laughs> right, yeah, wow. We're glad you're you're still here. The water um, in the bay is like six feet deep anyways. It's just. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, so Tom asks, with your work studying disease ecology, um, where are the pathogens coming from? Do we know where the virus and chytrid are coming from? Yep. Yeah, it's largely uh, human dispersed. So in a number of different ways, right, we can bring contaminated gear with us, whether that's like a boat or on clothing. Uh, for some things uh, it can be contaminated water, but also trade of animals that spreads pathogens all over. And especially in a place like Florida, which has so many invasive species, the pet trade here is massive. People are releasing these yeah. pets. Uh, and yeah. yeah, so it's coming mostly human mediated from just us and animals that we trade, unfortunately. Yeah. Do you know um, generally like what percentage of amphibian species in Southeast swamps are affected by either chytrid or the ronavirus? 
I don't know like a percentage. Uh, okay. I know that a lot of amphibians can be infected with both of those things, but it's so dependent mm -hmm. on the environment, uh, whether the environment mm -hmm. is conducive to the pathogens themselves, because there could be like a mismatch where it might be too hot for the pathogen, but the host mm -hmm. can still be susceptible. It's just it's summertime and that's when the species right. is active. So I would say most of them are probably so, to some degree, but uh, like fatally, it's it's we're figuring out more and more that, especially in the Southeast where a lot of this work hasn't been done, um, that it's affecting a lot more species than we thought. And sadly it's yeah. affecting the rarer species. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, does a changing habitat, like you mentioned that the Everglades have shrunk and you know everything's changing, does changing habitat impact how disease spreads in the swamp? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that's a good example with the Everglades, because that's a system that has all of its water now controlled by the South Florida Water mm -hmm. Management District. It's not natural water flowing in there. It's a series of levees mm -hmm. and channels. Um, so if it's a waterborne pathogen, right, it, uh, just like contaminants, it can spread uh, that way through water flows. Um, yeah. And, and just like, again, with invasive species in Florida, having these reservoirs that can potentially amplify or keep a pathogen circulating in a population uh, longer than it should be is also an issue. Right, yeah. Um, and then a question from Aaron. Um, do you know, have crocodilians existed in other parts of the US in recent geological time? Yes. Did the range uh, ever extend further north? Yeah. yeah, the range extended way further north. I think the oldest record of crocodilians is found in like northern Canada, like fossil records of crocodilians, which is pretty amazing. I'm not sure exactly how long ago because uh, paleontology and geology are not, not my bag, but I do remember reading that. But even in Florida, we had a number of crocodile uh, and alligator species that have since gone extinct just within the past like couple million years. Um, and a lot of cool uh, paleontologists, hurt paleo people at the Florida Museum are like describing these cool crocodilian species from a lot of the fossil deposit sites in Florida. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, and then just last question, what does a day in the life of your research look like? Like, are you in the swamp every day? Or Not what every, does it look like? Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately. Now, I, I'm probably in the swamp maybe a week out of the month. Yeah, so like a week. Now, when I was working as a field technician and as a field biologist, it was every day. Like you live, I lived in the Everglades and I lived in Big Cypress. So I was just, yeah. I couldn't escape it, which is fine. Uh, but now yeah. I have some sort of like normalcy. So I'm able to kind of structure my time. But I'm there around seven seven days out of the month, I have undergraduates who are answering different questions, uh, you know, with turtles and with snakes. So I also have like to watch to make sure they're doing fine, but it's a lot less time in the swamps, uh, maybe than I'd like. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for being with us, Arik. I love, oh, we love you your all. love for the swamp. And I also just wanted to say that, I know at the end of your presentation, you featured a sort of an alligator snapping turtle. Oh, oh. And your alligators. Oh, oh yeah. And and I, we just wanted to say that those are Claude's <laughs> roommates right now. Are the alligators? Oh, they are. And yeah, can you talk oh. about what you're holding? Yeah. So your I have hat? an alligator. Oh, I have two hats. So this is an alligator snapping uh -huh. turtle skull from nice. oh, from Louisiana. Uh, this was actually shot and killed by a, a friend's dad. Uh, in Louisiana, we eat them a lot, which is not a great conservation practice. Uh, you can actually see the bullet hole there. And oh, yeah, the legislation in Louisiana really needs to change, um, but mm -hmm. sad. And then this was an alligator that died of natural causes in Florida. Um, and it's just amazing to kind of have this uh, and I don't know, think about all the evolution that went into this and how these, mm -hmm. I don't know, they changed and remained and kind of looks like Claude too, you know, same color, same palette we're working with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, thank you again so much. Um, next up, we have Samantha Bach. All right. 
Well, thank you for having me here on this momentous occasion. I'm so happy to be able to celebrate Claude's Hatch Day. Um, I'm Samantha and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Georgia, um, where I study temperature dependent sex determination in the American alligator. Um, a hatch day in the field would take place in the picture you see on the right with this um, American alligator nest. And I'm going to be talking about some of the research that I've done on the um, nesting ecology of the American alligator, as well as um, potential impacts of climate change. Um, it's a big team effort, this research. So you'll see a lot of names on the bottom of this um, beginning slide. Those are all the people that were involved in this. All right, so climate change across the world is really causing these widespread and diverse responses um, from changes in the timing of key biological events like animal migrations to rearrangements of ecological communities, geographic rain shifts, and physiological responses. And while these environmental changes are widespread, the risks they pose vary widely across species with some species being particularly vulnerable. Now, among those species are those with temperature dependent sex determination or TSD. In these species, the temperature that embryos experience during development actually determines whether they will develop as a male or a female. And because of this, changes in temperature associated with climate change have the potential to skew offspring sex ratios and threaten population persistence. Now, most of the work of on climate change in TSD has focused on turtle species, but we know that different species with TSD are likely to respond differently to climate change, in part because of differences in the temperatures that produce males and females. In turtles, males are produced at low temperatures and females at high. You may have heard uh, hot chicks, cool dudes to remember that one. But in the tuatara, it's actually the opposite pattern where we have females being produced at low temperatures and males at high temperatures. And then in my personal favorite, the American alligator, females are actually produced at these extreme temperatures and males at more intermediate temperatures. And for species where sex ratios have actually been quantified in the field, we're already seeing pretty stark sex ratio skews in wild populations. For example, a study conducted a few years ago and covered by the New York Times showed that one of the largest populations of green sea turtles in the Great Barrier Reef have been producing many more females than males for nearly two decades, as demonstrated by the highly female bias sex ratios across all size classes. So clearly this isn't just an issue for the future, but it's affecting wild populations as we speak. Now, in order to mitigate the effects of climate change on these animals, we really need to study a wider breadth of species with TSD, notably crocodilians, and we need to better understand the factors that shape current nest environments. Crocodilians, which include alligators, crocodiles, caiman, gharial, are particularly important in this context because many species are already considered threatened or endangered. On the right is this phylogeny or family tree of extant crocodilian species. And you'll notice that over half of the species here are considered at least vulnerable um, according to their IUCN red list category. Now today I'll talk about the American alligator, which has been regarded as a conservation success story since populations were brought back from the brink of collapse with the introduction of the Endangered Species Act. And alligators, in addition to be the, being this success story, also serve as a really excellent model to understand factors shaping nest temperatures and sex ratios in the wild for a number of reasons. In particular, female alligators build these amazing nests that differ in their local habitats, composition, and architecture in ways that can influence the temperatures experienced by developing embryos. In addition, um, alligators are extremely sensitive to small changes in temperature. In fact, an increase of just two degrees Celsius can be the difference between a nest producing 100% females and 100% males, meaning that 27 years ago, if Claude's nest had been two degrees cooler, he may have been a Claudia. Now within this system, we're really interested in addressing three main questions. First, what do alligator nest temperatures actually look like in nature and what factors influence them? 
Second, based off of our understanding of how the environment shapes nest temperatures, how might we expect them to change with future climate change? And lastly, what are the consequences for hatchling sex ratios and what's next from a research and management perspective? So to address this first question, we deployed temperature loggers and 86 nests over eight years at two geographic sites in the northern and southern regions of the American Alligators Range. Um, our northern site is located in South Carolina at the Yaki Wildlife Center, and our southern site is located at, in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center. Now, to, in order to find each nest, we used aerial surveys with helicopters to spot nests from the sky. Here is Bill Wilkinson. He's a legendary alligator biologist, and he's looking for nests at our South Carolina site. And then on the right, you can see what a nest might look like from above. Um, and so here's the nest. And if you look a little closer, you can actually see the female and her guard hole near the nest. So once each nest was located, at least one temperature logger was placed inside the nest cavity. One temperature logger was placed in the vicinity of the nest to collect data on the microclimate. And then we also collected data from local weather stations. So here you can see a temperature logger being deployed in a nest. This orange circular device is the actual temperature logger that records temperature every five to 10 minutes for the entire incubation period. And so overall, we get data that looks something like this for each nest, where we have a nest temperature profile, which is the black line here, a microclimate profile, which is the gray line here, and then daily summaries of environmental conditions from the weather stations with these red and blue dots. And with this data, our first major question that we're interested in addressing is what ecological factors contribute to variation in nest temperatures. For a given nest, multiple factors may play a role, including the ambient environmental conditions, characteristics of the local microclimate, habitat features associated with the nest site, the architecture of the nest, and when the nest was laid or the nesting phenology. So in addition to the weather station data we collected and the temperature data from the microclimate, we also gathered information for each nest on the nest site, including local precipitation, local elevation and percent shade, information on the nest architecture, and including height, width, and depth to the egg cavity, and then phenology in the form of an estimated date of oviposition or day when the eggs were laid. And then using statistical modeling procedures, we wanted to determine which factors are most predictive of nest temperature. So what we found is perhaps unsurprisingly, the ambient environmental conditions, specifically the maximum and minimum air temperatures for the weather station, were really important in explaining variation in nest temperatures. But in addition to that, we also found that the nest microclimate, particularly daily maximum temperature, as well as features of the local habitat, including local precipitation, local elevation and percent shade, also influenced individual nest temperatures. In contrast, nest architecture and the timing of nesting did not influence nest temperatures. So overall from this, we're getting a better picture of what factors influence individual nest temperatures, but what about at a broader scale? We also wanted to look at trends in nest temperatures across years and the relationship to different weather station metrics. And so here we're showing each of the mean nest temperatures across years for each of our sites with respect to different weather station parameters, including the daily maximum temperature, daily minimum temperature, and daily precipitation. And what's really important here is we observe this really strong linear relationship between annual mean nest temperature and mean daily maximum air temperature. In fact, 80% of the variation in yearly mean nest temperature can be explained by maximum air temperatures. So based on this strong relationship between nest temperatures and ambient environmental conditions, the next question is how might nest temperatures change under future climate scenarios? Now to do this, we gathered fine scale climate projections for the areas encompassing nesting sites at each of our field sites, and then using the observed relationship between nest temperature and maximum air temperatures, we predicted nest temperatures up until the year 2100 for two different emission scenarios. So that's what these plots are showing, the predicted nest temperatures over 
um, the years up into 2100 for two different emission scenarios. Now here, the RCP 4.5 represents an, an emission scenario where carbon emissions peak in the year 2040, while um, the RCP 8.5 emission scenario um, is more of a business as usual scenario where carbon emissions continue to increase throughout the 21st century. Now overall, we conclude that based off of future changes in maximum air temperatures, we predict nest temperatures to increase by between 1.6 to 3.7 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. Now this may sound like a relatively small change, but considering how sensitive alligator sex determination is to temperature, this could have pretty substantial consequences for hatchling sex ratios. And our final research question asks just that. Based off of how alligator sex determination responds to temperature, how might hatchling sex ratios um, change with shifts in nest temperature, and what might be the next steps from a conservation perspective? So we took our predicted nest temperatures under different climate scenarios, and we translated them into predicted sex ratios based off of the experimental data be describing the relationship between temperature and alligator hatchling sex. And these plots are showing the predicted sex ratios in terms of percent male up until the year 2100, again, for those two different emission scenarios. And you'll notice that these plots are quite messy compared to the nest temperatures because very small changes in predicted nest temperatures can have pretty big consequences for sex ratios. But there's two pretty important points to get from these plots. For one, if you look at between the years 2040 and 2050, we can see that at both sites, regardless of emission scenario, we predict highly male bias sex ratios to result. However, if we look at between the years 2090 and 2100, our sex ratio predictions really diverge depending on emission scenario, where in the more mild emission scenario, sex ratios tend to still be quite male biased. However, under the more extreme emission scenario, we actually start to see those high female um, promoting temperatures promoting really highly female biased sex ratios. So what's the take home from these um, findings? Well, sex ratio projections are really uncertain based off of not only the um, emission scenario, but just because of the way that alligators and other crocodilians respond to temperature with their unique um, thermal sensitivity compared to other species. So overall, this point raises some really in, uh, important questions that we need to address in the future, because overall, this research suggests that climate change will produce substantial effects on future crocodilian populations. But we have a few key pieces of information that we're missing from a conservation perspective. For one, we currently don't know what hatchling sex ratios look like in the field, um, and there's no monitoring efforts of this nature in place to tell us what sex ratios are for alligators and many other crocodilian species. Secondly, what are the population level consequences of sex ratio skews and how might they exacerbate other threats to these species? And finally, can maternal nesting behaviors compensate for future environmental change? Um, I showed you earlier that some aspects of maternal nesting behavior, particularly the nest site choice, can influence nest temperatures. But whether this will allow populations to cope with warming temperatures in the future is currently unknown. So overall, research focused on these amazing animals and their ecology is really important for ensuring that these species are able to persist in the future um, to promote many hatch days to come. With that, I will thank um, all of the amazing people who contributed to this research and thank you for listening. Um, and hopefully there's some time for questions. Hey, Samantha, really great talk, um, even though it is kind of terrifying and devastating uh, to hear about the the like potential uh, uh, terrible ways this could go. Um, but anyways, really, really wonderful talk. Um, and we have a ton of questions. So I'm going to get right into it. But first, in all of your work with alligator nests and their temperatures, how close up have you been to an alligator baby? <laughs> 
an alligator baby or an alligator, a mad alligator mom. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I have some projects that are actually looking at the survival of alligator hatchlings in the field. So we collect eggs, hatch them out in the lab, and then we'll mark them and release them. And so we can um, follow them throughout life. So those hatchlings I've got pretty close to. Um, in the field, wild female alligators do not want to defend against humans. They will defend against other predators in the wild, but they really have want nothing to do with us. We do have a pair of alligators here at the lab that I work at um, that nest in captivity. And that's a whole nother story. <laughs> we tried to like uh, get the eggs from our resident female and she has no fear of humans. So that got a little bit gnarly, but um, overall they don't want anything to do with us. Yeah, I know that makes sense. Oh, geez. Um, I can't imagine what, what like a Thursday afternoon must look like in the lab. Um, but uh, on the topic of alligator defense and their nesting habits, how how close do alligators to one another tend to build nests? And like, what's the guard hole situation that you mentioned? Can you tell us more about just alligator nesting habits in general? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, So I think in general, um, females tend to have their territories where they tend to nest and over subsequent years, you'll see like an old nest from a previous year and then the current nest that a female has created in the current year. And so she tends to stay in her area, but sometimes they do overlap. Um, we actually have had this interesting case where um, at the South Carolina site over multiple years, two females have laid eggs in the same nest. And I don't know what the situation there is. There's like an experienced female and then a young female comes and she's like, oh, this looks good. So I'll just lay here. Um, I don't know, but I think that that's more the exception than the rule. So they generally um, will have their own separate areas where they spend a couple months just creating that um, structure for their babies. And then they will stay in the vicinity of the nest for the whole incubation period, making sure that everything's as it should be. Yeah, yeah that's, oh, wow. That's, I can imagine how that plays out in the wild. Um, yeah. I hope that's okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, you know, another kind of general question, but is is there, do we know the evolutionary reason for sex determinism being so closely tied with temperature and environment? Like, can you tell us what Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's counterintuitive. It's like, why would you leave up something so important up to chance or basically an environmental factor that can change so rapidly? And one idea is that it, because temperature and a lot of different traits in reptiles and alligators specifically are temperature dependent, temperature dependent sex determination may allow the um, mother to match the trait to the sex that benefits most from that. So temperatures that promote growth and growth is more important for male fitness, then she wants to disproportionately produce males at that temperature that they're going to do best at. So that's an idea, but we don't have great evidence um, empirically for that idea. So it's a big question still. Yeah, totally, totally. That makes sense. Um, thank you. And um, uh, back, back to the nests, one more question. What do they usually build their nests out of? Like, how do they gather their materials? Like, what, what does that process look like? Yeah, I wish I knew, like, I wish I was able to see a female, like, from start to finish build a nest. But in general, they'll, like, spend a few weeks where they're just, like, matting down a big area. Um, and they're, like, walking over it, kind of mashing down the vegetation. And then they'll... Um, get it, the vegetation like in this pile, but sometimes you'll find them with like sticks and like twigs, depending on the local environment, they pretty much use what they can find in the area. Um, but in general, it's like vegetation and mud and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I think it's interesting. Like you'll see um, sometimes early in the nesting season, like these we call them false nests, which is like a female started building a nest and then feel figured it's not good enough. So she started it again. Like there's multiple um, tries, multiple drafts for that um, nest. But yeah, I think that's in general what they typically do. 
Yeah, I've been there before, multiple drafts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, and uh, just uh, so so shifting gears to kind of like the bigger picture, since it you know there's a lot of evidence that climate will impact the future of alligators and other crocodilian species. You also said and other <laughs> you know sex determination and relying species. Um, what what can be done or like what are humans doing? Like what are ways that people can support that like devastating yeah. things not happening? <laughs> I think I think habitat preservation is a really important aspect of that because if these animals are are able to cope and kind of adjust their nesting to the local or environmental change, they're going to need to have intact habitats to do that. But then also we just really need to know the status of sex ratios in the field because if we did notice sex ratio skews happening, we could implement like artificial incubation experiments or um, programs where we bring nests or eggs from the wild and then we incubate them at the temperature to produce the sex that is underrepresented in the wild and then we could put them back. But we just, there's so much that we don't know um, right now that I think getting those answers to those questions is a really important um, thing that we can do. But overall, as like a society, I think protecting those habitats is really important. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, well, thank you so much for a great talk and um, it was really fun chatting with you. And best of luck in your in your future work. I hope I hope y'all can like get a ton of data. <laughs> and, <laughs> so. Like, yeah, fingers crossed. And um, next up, we are gonna go ahead and bring up Solomon to talk about some some gars to close out the night. Thanks, Samantha. <laughs> everybody. Thanks for having me. I think we can see the screen here. Just making sure about that. So I'm going to be switching gears from uh, some reptiles and amphibians, but continuing on with the swamp. So I uh, hope you're uh, in the mood to continue looking at some of those uh, organisms here. So you can see some of my friends here on the uh, left and right of your screen. But I first wanted to say happy birthday to Claude. Um, I, you know, had my own hat there, but I figured it was appropriate to have an alligator gar with a hat for an alligator's birthday. So wanted to make that shout out uh, clear right away. So a little bit about myself, just to show where I'm coming from uh, on, on this particular talk. So I've worked and done a lot of my research in the Great Lakes area. Um, I went to University of Michigan for my master's and PhD, and then went to Shedd Aquarium and University of Wisconsin-Madison for a postdoc. So I've worked in the aquarium slash museum setting uh, before, much like the California Academy of Sciences uh, crew. And then I made my way back up to work for the feds for a little bit at USGS and then eventually made my way down south to Nickel State University in Louisiana. So I've done a lot of Midwest work before coming down south and uh, having the opportunity to work with uh, some of the fish that I'll be talking about today. So I also want to make a shout out to uh, the crew that is kind of behind uh, doing a lot of this work. So my wife and my two children, um, this is just to show that uh, they uh, put up with my obsession with these animals, um, not to the same level that I do, but uh, I appreciate their enthusiasm. Also my graduate students from Gar Lab or graduate students, um, Audrey Bates, Dinah Cador, and Katie Wright are my current students, and I've got uh, four alumni so far. Um, and uh, they weren't required to have a photograph with GARS, but uh, I think it just uh, happened to work out that way. Or they had some, you know, strong suggestions towards that. So one of the tenets of our lab, which is called GAR Lab, where we focus on GARS but are not limited to that species or that group of species, is that these ancient fishes serve as these multifaceted tools to help us better understand ecology, evolution, and natural resource management. And because these organisms are valuable for understanding those different uh, concepts, they in, the, in and of themselves are important components of native biodiversity and should also be conserved. And so when I'm talking about GARS today, I hope you'll uh, keep in mind that a lot of what we've talked about, even with reptiles and amphibians and the previous speakers we did a great job, um, we can apply these ideas, this research, these questions, these conservation efforts to other wildlife and other ecosystems as well. 
I also wanted to make a shout out to the alligator guards at California Academy of Sciences. I've been able to visit there a couple times and uh, uh, one of the curators, uh, Bart Shepard, told me that your guards at California Academy of Sciences, some of them have been there since uh, the 1950s and 60s, which I think makes them the oldest, if not some of the oldest, um, uh, alligator gars in captivity anywhere um, and on exhibit. So this is some really old fish. Um, it was fun hanging out with some of the curators. This is Bart and this is uh, Louisa Rocha. This is not an alligator gar, it's an arapaima, but it's another sort of a mega fish. And uh, the best picture of, that I could find from a visit, which was a combo between these uh, gars and Claude was this. So here we have the tale of two organisms. I'll be talking about gars, but uh, of course I want to keep Claude in mind uh, with that idea as well. So with all of that being said, um, getting into GARS, I want to welcome you to Jurassic Park. So take a minute. There's going to be some GAR puns here and there. Sometimes I can't keep track of them. So the first part I want to address is what are GARS? So we've talked about a lot of these other really cool organisms. I'm going to talk about what GARS are, but from my perspective. So um, when you think about Claude, Claude serves as this animal ambassador for other alligators, for other organisms that live in the swamp. Um, and so I want to think about GARS as sort of ambassadors and really kind of fit that with the story, um, my own story, of sort of working with these fishes and how I came to appreciate them and hopefully uh, pass along some of that appreciation uh, to you all as well. And then I'll get into some of the conservation challenges that they face with, uh, with just a couple of examples. So a little bit of my own background. As a kid, I was interested in dinosaurs, these sort of prehistoric organisms. Um, they really fascinated me. I was also interested in what we call creatures, like the creepy crawlies, some of the underappreciated organisms reptiles, amphibians, insects. And so during that time, when I moved from uh, North Dakota to Ohio, um, some neighborhood kids realized my interest in creatures or nature in general and gave me a copy or several back issue copies of a magazine called Ranger Rick, which is a uh, um, magazine put up by the National Wildlife Federation. Some of you might be familiar with it. And so I was leafing through a Ranger Rick magazine. I was very fascinated with it. And I flipped to the middle one day and I saw this giant fish that looked like an alligator with fins instead of legs. And uh, as I've kind of given away from the beginning, that fish was an alligator gar. So I was really fascinated with this sort of prehistoric look to this animal and uh, how it reminded me of the dinosaurs one of my favorites, T-Rex, this large head, lots of teeth. But again, it reminded me of present day alligators as well. And yet this was this fish with these crazy adaptations that has helped them survive, at least their lineage has survived, for a very long period of time, even you know, outlast the dinosaurs. Um, so that illustration was like emblazoned on my mind and uh, um, really kind of got me interested in those fish. Um, and then eventually I unfortunately lost that article. That's a whole other story. Um, and I ended up doing some other work between, excuse me, between being in uh, elementary school and junior high before circling back to graduate school where I was able to focus on guards. Along the way in undergrad, I got interested in ichthyology and uh, ended up having the opportunity to work on guards. For my dissertation, I focused on spotted guards. For my master's, I worked on Chinook salmon and also long nose guards. So some specific uh, connections that way too. Um, while I was finishing up my dissertation, uh, my dad was digging through some old stuff at home and he found this illustration uh, that I drew when I was a kid of a spotted gar. So as you can see, I wasn't you know too far off, maybe a little bit spot on there. Um, so it was kind of neat to be able to um, see that sort of foreshadowing and uh, working with these animals that I found fascinating. Flash forward to a little bit later in graduate school, I came to a um, conference in Louisiana and connected with a small university, Nichols State University, and they were going out to sample for alligator gar. So I was able to change my flight, get on that field uh, cruise, and uh, actually able to sort of uh, tangibly um, hold that, uh, that type of fish that kind of got me interested um, in the work that I do um, all the way back then when I was a kid. So what are gars? I usually put them in the context of ancient fishes. So these ancient organisms, living fossils, as if you will, sometimes considered kind of a controversial term, but organisms that are alive today that look a lot like their ancestors in the fossil record. So here you can see a fossil gar. So kind of got the same body plan that I showed you in some of those other pictures. Um, they've been alive since the uh, about 157 million years ago. So the family Lepisosteidae, the gars, dates back even before the Cretaceous. So they're older than Tyrannosaurus rex. So 
could we have seen this sort of scenario? This is by one of my uh, favorite uh, fish illustrators, Ray Troll, as this scenario of a velociraptor versus a garb. Uh, the actual, you know, timelines kind of sync up. So maybe it's something that uh, somebody might have experienced or seen way back then, at least other organisms alive at the time. But if you flash forward to modern gars, compare that fossil gar on this side to modern gars like the spotted gar, you'll see that they look very similar to each other. The scale patterns, the setting of where the fins are, that elongate snout. So they've kind of found this body plan that works and they've stuck with it for over 150 million years. So they've been able to adapt. And so what are some of those adaptations? I'm gonna talk about those next. The family, Leposostiidae, has seven extant species. So they range from Southern Canada all the way down to Costa Rica. So decent spread through North America and also Central America. There's also a species that lives in Cuba. They're characterized by having these ganoid or diamond shaped scales. They're made of a compound very similar to tooth enamel. So extremely tough, very armored or garmored if you will. And uh, they've got these elongate jaws with lots of teeth. Here you can see a gar skull head on, lots of teeth kind of coming at you there. Um, they're adapted for grasping and holding prey, typically going to be fish, but also crustaceans, sometimes small birds, reptiles, and amphibians. They can also breathe air, which allows them to survive in low oxygenated waters like you might find in a swamp or a slow moving bayou. So this allows them to, you know, sort of persist where more conventionally respiring fish may not be able to do so. They're also long lived. I already mentioned that uh, Bart Shepard mentioned that the alligator gars that you have at Calicad um, arrived in the 1950s and 60s, at least some of them, we know that alligator gars can live for over 100 years. And even some of the smallest species, like the short nose gar down here, can live for 50 years, which we only recently uncovered from some of our research. So relatively long-lived uh, animals, and they're kind of at home in North America. They're found in a lot of swamps, but they're also found in some rivers and streams and large lakes as well. So what are some of the other adaptations that have helped them survive for this song? They have poisonous eggs, which is an interesting adaptation. We don't see that in a whole lot of fish, um, but there's some interesting sort of characteristics of that toxicity. Those eggs are toxic to mammals, birds, and arthropods, but they're not toxic to fishes, which makes for an interesting question. Why have poisonous eggs, you know, and you're a fish, laying them in, you know, in water, and why wouldn't you have them be toxic to other fish? And we think that because of the places that gars are adapted to living, so this is a picture of one of those swamps like uh, Arik showed um, in his presentation, uh, they live in these shallow warm water environments and they lay their eggs in even shallower environments, um, usually attached to vegetation. And so some of the other organisms there might not be fish because you know, some of our conventionally respiring fish that have to breathe oxygen from the water may not live in these habitats. So maybe they don't need to be poisonous to fish. However, there's crawfish, maybe there were crabs at one time, there's plenty of water birds, maybe some marsh mammals. Um, those are the animals that might be preying on the eggs. And so we think that this toxicity might have evolved in response to the predators that are actually there. We've also found out that uh, baby gars also retain that toxicity for a little bit of time too. So there is no such thing as gar caviar. Well, if there is gar caviar, you just shouldn't eat it. Although people do eat gar uh, for the other parts like the, the meat, and I've had it too. So I think it's a uh, it's worth trying out. If you want to learn more about this bizarre adaptation of poisonous eggs, I'd invite you to check out our episode on bizarre beasts. Um, you can Google that and uh, find that episode. It's got some interesting uh, footage and uh, background story to that. So ecological value of these fish. Um, gars as a whole can help maintain ecosystem balance as apex predators. So they're usually the top of the food chain. Um, oftentimes when a gar gets big enough, they don't even make very good prey for alligators. So that's usually the only other predator that might be able to take them out in particular environments. They can also help us understand more about fish migrations and floodplain connectivity, which is where these fish uh, tend to spawn. And they can also be used as indicators of restoration, which our team is using. So we're looking to restore floodplain to river connectivity. We're using gars as sort of um, indicators of restoration success. If these fish can make it into the floodplains, spawn, and then move their way back out. Um, and so here you can see a relatively large alligator gar that we got to work with uh, back in December with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, and so they're these huge animals. They're part of, you know, North America's really large uh, giant creatures. So really cool adaptations that they've got. There's some other new research that's come out about them where gars, because of their ancient lineage, actually have a genome that's organized more similarly to humans than it is to other fish that are used in a lot of biomedical and 
evolutionary developmental research like the zebrafish. So what we've recently found out is that the gar, specifically the spotted gar, but also other gar species, can work as sort of a go-between to help us understand more about these model organisms used in biomedical research and kind of translate that to apply them to a human. So they kind of work as this bridge or Rosetta Stone. So they've got this kind of cool uh, biomedical value as well on top of what they have uh, to do for us in ecosystems. Um, I also tried to, you know, uh, show gars to my students. This is my biology of fishes class. One of their other adaptations, all fish have slime, but gars are particularly slimy. Here we're comparing gars to uh, rainbow trout. And as you can see, there's a lot of, uh, you know, sliminess to them, but I like to at least uh, introduce my students to gars right off the bat in that class. So shifting gears to some conservation challenges that these fish face. So I mentioned that, uh, you know, they persisted for a really long time, all the way back since the, about 150 million years ago, outlasted the dinosaurs, but will they outlast us? And there's some questions about that. Although they've been well adapted to swamps, low oxygenated environments, a lot of different habitat types, um, there's the advent of uh, different types of uh, sport harvest called bow fishing and spearing that uh, unfortunately these fish are oftentimes considered to be trash fish. So fish of lesser value compared to salmon or trout. And so therefore they get um, killed and kind of just left on the bank like this. And other times when we have bow fishing tournaments, um, they get killed by the thousands and just dumped into a landfill. And so we look at this as not being great stewards of our natural resources. These organisms have a role to play in their native environments, in their ecosystems, instead of just serving as fertilizer or just being dumped up on the bank. In fact, management agencies all the way back in the 1930s were trying to get rid of gars because they thought they were affecting other more desirable game fish populations. So this is a picture of what they called the electric gar destroyer. Um, which was basically something that ran electrical current into the water at such a high voltage um, that it would break the backs and uh, kill these gars. And that sort of idea even ran through management up until the 1980s, where in some states, if you caught a gar on hook and line, it was actually illegal to throw it back into the water alive. You had to snap its back or kill it in some fashion, and then put it back. So our lab and many others are trying to work towards improving the reputation of these fish and uh, hopefully leading to better conservation. This is the 1930s, some of this stuff still happens today. Flash forward to an example up in Minnesota, where we have short-nosed gars and long-nosed gars. There were some spear fishers that were using this new type of uh, fish finder technology that uh, ended up killing all these gars, ended up being about 83. And they recorded it and they posted it to social media. So, you know, plenty of people can see it on social media, including people like me that might call it out and say, look, this isn't a great use of native species or natural resources. It turned out that they just took all these fish, killed them, and then threw them in the woods. So not a great use of natural resources or native fishes. Eventually, that info got to a state representative, uh, Representative Jamie Becker Finn, and she wanted to find a way to change that. Why are we using our natural resources, these native species like this? So what can we do to switch that up? I saw um, her and a colleague post something to Twitter that they were trying to get this legislation passed through. And so I got in touch with them, I was actually able to send them our research and research done by others to show that these are valuable native species, they don't harm game fish populations. And so lo and behold, that information got put into testimony and we got legislation passed for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources to set limits for gar harvest. So this is a really cool kind of, you know, turnabout of something is posted to social media and then we've got the science to back up reason for change and legislation change. And this is over the course of maybe a month or two. So it made the local media there. So it's kind of neat to see policy and conservation work together to kind of enact some change uh, relatively quickly there. So um, just one example of some of the efforts we're trying to do to change the reputation of these so-called, in some circles, trash fish. We also tried to use science communication in other avenues, not just publishing in journal articles. If you're familiar with the uh, Ologies podcast, we got to do an episode with Ali Ward. Uh, we featured our research done by myself and graduate students on NPR Science Friday. We had an article come out uh, just uh, earlier this year in National Geographic about some of the work that we're doing with alligator gars um, using fin clips and non-lethal way of sampling them in order to try to learn more about those populations. And we also get into other popular media like something like Field and Stream, which is a hunting and fishing magazine. So we try other avenues in order to get these messages of conservation across. And I want to leave you with one last uh, fish tale. So 
going back to Ranger Rick, I was working on a project one day at Shedd Aquarium and I was checking Twitter and I saw the National Wildlife Federation posted a picture of a raccoon. And it turned out that it was National Raccoon Day. And that picture was an illustration of Ranger Rick, who is the mascot for the magazine Ranger Rick. And I tweeted at them and I said, hey, you know, Ranger Rick is how I got into GARS. And I'm still looking for this back issue that I saw as a kid and eventually lost. I've been searching for this for over 20 years. My parents, friends, everyone had been looking. And so it was, you know, the first time I decided to tweet at them. Went home, woke up the next morning to this tweet where they sent me that image. Like, is this the Gator Gar illustration you remember? And it turned out it was from their April 1983 issue. And I just could not believe it. It was exactly how I remembered it. Um, and so I saved it everywhere, tried to make sure that I would never lose that again. Turns out that they had one more copy of that uh, magazine and they sent it to me when I was working there. So it was kind of neat to come full circle. And to add an additional step to that in 2020, I was able to write an article on GARS uh, for Ranger Rick and hopefully introduce a new generation to these cool fishes, these denizens of the swamp that share areas with, you know, amphiumas and alligators and uh, other cool animals, hopefully introducing them to these lesser known creatures. So with that, I will mention also that they've got plenty of circulation, so they're probably going to get a lot more uh, um, play than many of my journal articles, and I'm okay with that. I'd like to thank uh, several people that have contributed to this research and make a gargantuan thank you to all of you. And if there's time for questions, that's great, but I will throw out there, if you have guard questions, better call Saul. You can find me through these uh, different uh, social media platforms or just find our website, my email's there. Thank you very much. Better call Saul. So good. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. Um, we definitely have time for questions. Um, so we were wondering, Ari and I were wondering backstage, and then Joy mentioned, why are they so slimy? <laughs> why slimy? That, that is a great question. I don't know if I've got a great answer for that. I think it could be when they're living in these very slow moving sluggish environments that they produce mm -hmm. more slime in order to, you know, better insulate themselves from the environment. Um, it seems like even dead gars produce a lot of slime. Like we put them on ice and mm -hmm. we bring them back out to dissect them and they actually have more slime than they had when they went in. So it's almost like, hag fishing in that way to where like, what, what's the deal with the slime? Um, and there's also interesting things where like, and you could get this with, with a lot of different uh, organisms, but their slime is unique. Some people are allergic to the slime too. So not everybody. And then some people, the more they handle it, they get an allergic reaction to it. So there could be some unique aspects to the slime that we just don't know about yet. I'm not allergic to it, but it definitely works as a good moisturizer, I will say. So, you know, maybe if we could, find a way to harness it and use it for something else, then that's, that's something. So it's unless you're allergic to it. Uh, yeah. Unless exactly. You, you have warning labels, Christina. Come on. <laughs> right. <laughs> Spray a little bit on your hand before you put it all yeah, over yeah, your yeah, face. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Um, so that makes me also wonder like what makes their eggs poisonous? Is it something they eat? Is it something internal? What is it? Do we That's know? a great question. In in most cases, um, fish aren't producing the toxin themselves, even though it's called an ichthyotoxin mm -hmm. very generically. It's usually sequestered from um, or garnered if you will, um, from bacteria. Um, and so we're working on that. There's a, a graduate student that was looking into that and some other uh, folks at Nickel State. Um, we don't know exactly yet. We're looking at the weight, trying to characterize the proteins and what exactly is going mm -hmm. on. Um, so it seems like it's probably bacterial driven. We, we aren't guessing the fish itself is producing it, but what we did find mm -hmm. from some of that preliminary research is that even the male gonads seem to be toxic as well. So it could be that it's a combination huh. of the gonads between males and females that are, you know, toxic. And we didn't know that the larvae are also toxic to a certain point either. So, um, there's still a lot of mysteries with that, but it's probably helped them survive for as long as they have. Yeah. Um, I was going to bring this up too. Noel just commented, 
Love the Gar Aquarium. I just saw one gulping air. So do you want to talk about that? Those fish, those fish behind you? Yeah, yeah. There's um there's seven species of gars. I've got six of them here, and the seventh is in our lab because he's on timeout because he doesn't get along with everybody right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so they'll go up for air um on occasion. So usually it has to do with activity level and temperature. So if they're swimming around a fair amount or if the water's warm, they're usually gonna have to go up for air. But if the water is relatively cool and they're not being very active, they'll, uh, they can stay underwater for a longer period of time. So they have gills that they can use, but if it's any level of activity, usually they've got to go up for air. And so these, these ones all get along. I, I feed them mainly frozen shrimp, so that kind of tempers them a little bit. Um, but yeah, they've, they've made the trek around since grad school for some of them. Wow. Wow. Um, that's so nice. Uh, so Aaron asks, which well-known fish are gars most closely related to? That's a great question. If you've heard of a fish called the bowfin, that is the closest relative. Mm -hmm. So in the south, especially around here, they call them shoe pick. Further up north, they might call them dogfish or mudfish. The, the bowfin has so many different names. Um, but it is, at, for the most part, the only member of its family that is alive today. Um, we just... Uh, published or not, we put in a, a preprint of an article to actually split them into two because genetic ep evidence and morphological evidence suggests that there's at least two uh, species there. So they similarly breathe air. They live in these environments that are low oxygen. They don't have a long mm -hmm. snout. They do produce a lot of slime. Um, they don't have toxic eggs. You can buy both in caviar, um, especially in the South, and they're trying to sell that caviar to alleviate the stress of caviar on sturgeon which, you know, of course, are mm. very threatened throughout the range. And you can get caviar from sturgeon, but it's usually going to be farmed. So um, so that's their closest yeah. relative. But that's that's pretty much it. Other than that, they're kind of way out there. Um, preliminary research suggests that they also have some of the slowest evolutionary rates of any other vertebrate. So they're, like, sticking with looking like that for the foreseeable future. <laughs> well, when you have, I mean, when you look that beautiful, like, why would you... Why would you change? Um, <laughs> yeah, that beautiful snout, those big eyes. Um, so question, so where did this idea that gar negatively affected game fish populations, where did that come from? You know? Sure, that's a great question. So, you know, I think you need to look back in history. So indigenous peoples actually, it lights out for them, just like it is at some of the animals. So, um, so indigenous peoples, appreciated the gars. They used, you know, the scales for different things, the hides. Um, of course, they, you know, consumed the meat. Um, but then when colonists uh, came over to North America, they looked at them as having lesser value. They didn't look like the fish they were used to eating, you know, back in mm -hmm. Europe for the most part. And so therefore, they kind of got deemed these lesser fish. Um, you can't fillet them like you could a bluegill or a salmon or a trout. They've got those armored scales. So you got to actually cut right. them with thin snips. So considered to have lesser value. They're voracious predators. And, you know, anglers don't like them because when you try to like set a hook in them, that bony skull doesn't allow for that. So it actually makes them more challenging. Um, and so it, they just kind of developed this bad reputation, but it was more of a colonist perspective for that. Um, and so we've now been trying to work that back into, you know, they actually have value. Let's listen to, you know, indigenous knowledge about these fish and many other things um, and see what value valuable roles they play in, you know, their native ecosystems. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. That story you had about Minnesota. Um, it's so amazing to see that something can change that quickly. I was really excited. Policy sometimes. Yeah. Um, and then just a couple more questions. Um, how are GAR populations doing in the United States in the Southeast United States in general? Yeah, that's another great question, which is relative to geography. So something like the spotted gar, which we use for a lot of those, that genomics research I mentioned, um, we spawn mm -hmm. those fish in the lab and we send those embryos to places like Michigan State, where our colleagues are that can do like the fancy genomics work. But we've got a lot of them down here in Louisiana. However, spotted gars are endangered in Ohio, Pennsylvania. They're threatened in mm -hmm. parts of Canada. They're a species of concern in Michigan. Alligator gars are relatively secure here in Louisiana. Um, Texas, they're also secured, but Texas also has very progressive regulations. Louisiana has no regulations, so we need to do better with that. Mm -hmm. um, as Eric said, I think about um, alligator snapping turtles. Um, but um, 
in other parts of the range, alligator gars have been extirpated. So they're actually trying to restore those populations in places like Illinois, Tennessee, Kentucky. So depending on the species, they're doing okay in some places, but they're, you know, not doing great in others. Yeah. Um, the final question, there are seven species of gar. If you had to choose a favorite, which one would it be? Oh, this question comes up so often. I, I did yeah. my dissertation on spotted gars and the long nose gar was the first one I ever saw in the wild, but oh, it seems so mainstream if you can be that way with alligator gars, but I would say <laughs> alligator gar, cause that's the first one that I saw in that magazine that kind of introduced mm -hmm. me to those fish. And, you know, I feel it's like it's really coming full circle talking about alligator gars at an alligator party, you know, for Calicad. So uh, I, if I had to choose, that's what I would go with. But I, I like to think I love them all equally. <laughs> <laughs> just maybe alligator gars a little bit more equally just a little bit also we just wanted to say how wonderful your drawing was from <laughs> from when you were 12 do you still draw gars I you know like when on you, occasion when you I do I try to get my kids to, to draw gars but I, I practice mm -hmm. alongside them so now my gars are drawn in crayon or made out of play-doh or something but I, I try to keep up a little bit of practice a little bit of gar work from time to time so it's not gonna stop good good, good. Um, well thank you so much for being here and celebrating with us it's so so awesome to have you here thanks so much yeah. Okay, I'm gonna bring Aria back up to close out the night. Hi, my face is just like Hi. this. <laughs> um, yes, thank you so much, Arik and Samantha and Solomon for sharing um, all these wonderful, 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 wonderful swamp critters with us. Um, learning about those little teeny legged salamanders and alligator nests and and of course gars um has been such a joy and such a special way to celebrate our very special alligators home yeah yeah um yeah no i just i think somebody asked in the chat like if we have gars at the academy and we yes we do we have alligator gars so if you're if you're you know looking at claude you're kind of downstairs and you're looking at him from kind of below water if you just turn around um, and there's like a, I guess you have to go around some other exhibits, but if you just turn around, uh, there's a big, big exhibit with some beautiful gars. So um, please pay attention to them and admire their snouts next time you visit. <laughs> um, so <laughs> thanks again. Oh, I think we lost Christina. Um, Okay, well, thanks, thanks again, everybody. And uh, we we here at Night School are, are coming to you uh, on the first and third Thursdays of every month. And next up, we're coming uh, October sixth. And I think I see Christina coming back shortly. But October sixth, we're back to talk about diatoms. Christina, I'm going to pass it right back to you to talk about our diatoms episode coming up. Yeah. Um, so diatoms. Um, they are sometimes called glass houses, jewels of the sea, floating solar panels, but they're microalgae and they're in our oceans. And they, I think they account for um, like a third of the oxygen that we breathe. And they're also incredibly beautiful. So come and see some diatom art. And um, yeah, subscribe to our channel. Um, and share this episode with anyone who might enjoy it. And we enjoy having you here with us all the time. So have a good night, everyone. Take care. Happy Hatch Day, Claude. <laughs> Bye. Bye.